Thank you very much indeed. Um, it's a huge honour to be uh, standing here today. Um, I went to a particularly harsh, so British, uh, boarding school and I left there at the age of 18 and I was always the kid in the back of the class who would uh, cause problems. So I'm kind of wondering if today is uh, karma come back to haunt me. So. Anyway, um, I would just like to start with a short clip and then we'll uh, get to um, uh, what the presentation is about. They're shooting them like dogs. Yeah. Eight o'clock, one freezing morning at the Nepalese border. At 5,700 meters altitude, it seems the time is always frozen. Dozens of Tibetans are walking in line, silently, through the mountains of snow, trying to reach India and see the Dalai Lama, their spiritual leader. The deep silence of the camp, where Romanian and foreign climbers gathered, is killed by a machine gun. Everybody can see a Chinese soldier standing in the shooting position. He opens fire, the bullets hit human flesh. Tibetans fall to the ground. One of them seems to escape the bullets but is hit by a second round. He dies in the snow. As if nothing happened, the group of pilgrims walks away and never looks back. The Pro TV cameraman gets the incredible scenes on tape. He is one kilometer away from the Tibetans when he watches another victim falling down. The Danish and the British climbers are simply overwhelmed by what they see. It's very strange for me uh, to see all this thing happens. Uh, to see this thing happen so so close, uh, I'm not used to it. I don't know what right the Chinese think they have to do things like this. There's no need to to kill. Hours pass by. A stranger arrives in the camp. He is one of the hunted Tibetans. He hides in the toilet. You wanted to go to Dalai Lama? Huh. There's a Tibetan in the toilet behind me, hiding from the Chinese military. Another Tibetan man was shot and left to die in the snow over five hours ago. I saw the soldiers firing. Sergio makes a risky move. He helps the Tibetan with some clothes and food. I gave him some of my clothes. I also shared with him some food I had. In the distance, three Chinese soldiers count their victims. Undisturbed, they leave one body in the snow. Trying to find new information, the Chinese soldiers enter the climbers' camp. They have more than 20 prisoners, seven of them are children. For them, the pilgrimage to the Dalai Lama will end in a jail cell. The Chinese soldiers are smoking, relaxed. For them, it's just another successful mission. In spite of what all the climbers witnessed, the Chinese news agency, Xinhua, announces that Chinese frontier soldiers tried to persuade the group of Tibetans to go home, but the Tibetans refused and attacked the soldiers. These were then forced to defend themselves and to wound two persons. This is just another episode from an endless story. It started 47 years ago when the Dalai Lama was forced by the Chinese troops to flee in Dharmshala. Now the Dalai Lama heads the Tibetan government in exile from India. Just to see him or touch him, many Tibetans pay with their lives. Meanwhile, year after year, they are forced to watch their beloved religious temples turned into rubble. Okay, so um, what you've just... So witnessed is a murder, um, it's like not the stuff of Hollywood, it's not made up, um, it's not drama, it's the real thing. Um, and I, I sort of sat where you were sitting back in 2006. Um, my editor at a magazine in London I was on contract for called me up and asked me and said, uh, you know, do you think that there's a bigger story there? Do you think that there's something that we can report. And um, at the time I was, I was really doing a lot of, you know, quite sort of uh, macho type stuff. I was flying around the world, I was going to Sudan, I was interviewing jihadist militias. Um, this is me in Colombia um, covering the drug war and to wearing a bulletproof vest. We're about to uh, fly over uh, Gorilla held um, area of the cocoa plantations, and so my editor calls and says, "We want, you know, we're interested in Tibet, and yeah, we have a phrase in the news media: it's compassion fatigue." And um, all I knew about Tibet was sort of lava lamps and beads and hippies and uh, tie-dye t-shirts. Um, 
it didn't really seem like a particularly glamorous assignment, I have to say. But um, I thought about it and I made some calls and I called the international campaign for Tibet and I said, look, you know, we're looking at this. Is, it, is there a bigger story here that's worth reporting? Then they said, well, thousands of people come over that same path where that girl was shot, but no one hears anything about it. I'm like, why does no one hear about it? She, she said, because people like you aren't interested. I'm like, okay. Uh, well, I am interested. So, is there a way that you could find me a guide and I could hike up in the mountains and I can see what's going on? And uh, my contact with the international campaign for Tibet said, yes, they had a guide. It was very dangerous. Not for me, but my guide, because when you report human rights in China, anyone who helps you or is deemed to be helping you can go to prison for a very long time. They can be tortured. So it was a huge risk that this guy was taking. And he said, but he would take me up in the mountain. So I flew into um, Nepal, Kathmandu. And we flew up in a tiny little plane uh, up in the mountains to a place called Lukla, which is a little airstrip on the side of a mountain, which is a bit, which is a bit like sort of landing on an aircraft carrier. Um, we touched down and we started to hike. And we joined a lot of other people climbing the same way. There were a lot of mountain climbers. There were people looking to climb Everest um, at a mountain called Choyu, which is near to where we were heading. So all of a sudden, you know, you're, like you're struck immediately by your walking in step with some of the richest people in the world and some of the poorest, like the people who live in Nepal and the mountains. Um, so we hiked up and the higher and higher we got, um, the less there were other people around. This is beyond the place called Namche Bazaar and like this is where the trail forks. If you go right you go to Mount Everest and if you go left you go to the border with Tibet and the refugee routes and that's where we were heading. Um, my guide told me not to tell anyone that I was a journalist. Um, we couldn't <coughs> announce what we were doing at all and we noticed as we got higher and higher that people seemed to be more scared. That there was a, there was a paranoia which is in stark contrast to the beauty of the mountains. It's the first time I've ever been in the Himalaya. And they're huge. I mean, the scale of these um, things is just enormous. Um, I'm going to show you um, a satellite picture just to give you an idea of scale. Um, this is India and Nepal. In India and Nepal. And up here is Tibet. And that's the Himalaya. So, Tibet is the size of Western Europe. Most people think it's a sort of mountain. Shangri-La, it's a tiny little place where there's a lot of incense and monks chanting, which is true, but it's huge, it's massive. So we hike higher and higher up, and this is an idea of the scale. Just across that image there would take you, you know, at least a week, like maybe more, just to give you an idea of like how, how big it is. So we go up higher and higher up, and children started to come the other way. You know, children probably about the same age that, like you teach, look, like a lot of them younger. And they looked as though they'd been escaping a war zone. They were tattered, they were grimy, and um, many of them had frostbite. And they'd come over that high pass that you saw on the video, which is like this, which is 20,000 feet above sea level. So the temperature is minus 40. Um, oxygen is half what it is at sea level. So if you can imagine running upstairs, breathing through a straw, that's roughly to what it's like coming across this. Now the children coming like the other way, that's another picture of the mountains. That, so that's the sheer scale of it. I mean, you can see the peaks. That's frostbite. So many of these young children who were 12, 13, 14, even younger had to blackened limbs and they were you know, holding them because like this. 
And they were very distrustful of Westerners and me. You know, they didn't really want to say anything. They, they, they just wanted to keep, keep going. And, you know, I covered wars in Africa and seen things before. And normally you can get people to talk. But there was something about China that people were terrified. So we carried on going up the mountain. Like, this is a young girl who I met much later on, like you lost her toes.